Hello. Welcome to Storytime with Moog. I am Moog. And today we're reading Frankenstein by Mary Charlotte Shelley. <laughs> Starting with part two, chapter nine. But first, reading updates. I am listening to Women Talking by Miriam Toews. T-O-E-W-S. And I'm 72% of the way through. It's a pretty short book. Um, audio, it takes an hour. I usually listen to it at a faster pace than just one, like, the regular normal pace. I do, like, one and a half or something like that. Um, and I'm 72% of the way through. I am enjoying it. I did watch the movie um, back when it won... I forgot which Oscar, but it won an Oscar. So, like, I when that happened, I, like, watched it. And I enjoyed it. And I was like, oh, look, it's also a book. Of course I'm going to read the book and then compare the two. And I am enjoying it. Um, the book is told from August's perspective. So he is the male who is writing all of the meaning minutes down. Um, if you are unfamiliar with the movie or the book, um, Women Talking is a story about this Mennonite um, collection of people, and the women are all deciding whether they want to leave, whether they want to stay and fight, or whether they want to stay and do nothing and pretend like nothing has happened. Um, terrible things have been happening to these women and to their children, and so the most of the book is taking place in, I think it's two days, and they are discussing all of the meeting. And the book is told from the perspective of August, who is a male character and who is taking the minutes down um, from these meetings. So it's interesting that we are getting the women's perspective, um, what they're saying in the meetings, how they're interpreting everything. And then also we're getting insights um, from August and his perspective, because he's also not like a well-revered male in this community. So it is very interesting. Um, I enjoyed it. Watched the movie. It made me sad. <laughs> um, I started reading There There by Tommy Orange. It is the community read for Chicago. So they're doing, um, like the library is doing like a bunch of programming and book discussions and stuff. I'm not going to any of the book discussions, but the author is coming at the end of the initiative and they're going to live stream it on YouTube. So I'm going to watch that, but I am currently reading it. It's very exciting. Um, it is, each chapter is following a different person in the Oakland area and they are, um, some descendant from, uh, a native person. And it's interesting to see, like, how the culture is intermixed into their lives, whether they're ignoring it or trying to fully embrace it. So that's where I am so far. I'm not super far into the book. Um, I'm reading the large type, but so, like, page numbers aren't going to make any sense. But this is where I am. <laughs> I'm this far. <laughs> um, and it's I'm enjoying it so far. It's good. Each character seems to have, like, a pretty unique story and a pretty unique voice, so that's helpful and good. And then I, from the library, picked up Aviva versus the Dybbuk, and I did look up how to pronounce that because I did not know how to pronounce it earlier. And it is a book that was picked by my book club. I have no idea what it's about. I did not read the back. I just know that it is a small book. And that's what I got. Aviva versus the Dybbuk by... Mari Lowe. So yeah, <laughs> those are the books in my life right now. Today, we're reading Frankenstein. I'm really excited. We're starting with part two, chapter nine. Um, what has happened so far? So high level notes of what has happened um, and to get to uh, to get us to this point. So we have Victor Frankenstein um, who has gone off to school and he is super, super interested in science. And uh, what he grew up reading um, is old antiquated science and called sad trash and he like was turned off by it and maybe turned off by science a little bit. But then there was this one professor, this one professor who was like, oh no, all science is valid. Even the people that we don't necessarily um, 
like follow now like they were the foundations and all of these other things and victor victor is like hmm life and death is cool so he like studied decaying bodies and you know super normal things that a human would do and was like hmm what if what if i what if i make life from things that are dead and no no why would i start with something small i'm gonna start with an eight foot person and i got all of their body parts from from a slaughterhouse because again same thing to do and he does it successfully his monster runs away and he's like well monster ran away can't find him but he's like riddled with this like anxiety like thinking that he's going to be around like any turn that he takes like all these things um his childhood friend comes to visit him and is like dude you haven't like written or anything and like are you okay and victor's like mm, i'm okay totally okay everything's fine we're good and he's like you're not okay i'm gonna take care of you so then his friend takes care of him for a little bit and he gets a letter from his family his family's super concerned victor writes back to his family and he's like oh everything's fine we're doing great um i'm gonna come visit um, just let me know when. It'll be fun time. His dad writes to him and was like, Victor, my son, um, I was just going to write you a date to say to come at this time, but you need to know what's going on. Your brother has been murdered. So Victor's like freaking out as one would, and he immediately knows that his monster has done this. Doesn't know how, doesn't know any of the details, and he's just like, my monster did it obviously so he goes back home um the there is a girl who has been accused and of murder and she is talked into say like um confessing to say that she did it thinking that she's going to be absolved from everything and everything will just go back to normal blah 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 um she confesses does not go back to normal. Um, she's convicted. She dies in prison. Um, Victor, of course, is taking this super, super hard and is just having a real rough time because he knows that his monster did it, but he obviously can't tell people, like, I made a person and it's killing everybody. Sorry, y'all. So his dad is like, Victor, you're super sad and this is a bummer. Um, let's go on vacation. So they go on vacation and... Victor's, like, walking about in the mountains, and he sees somebody who's inhumanly tall and inhumanly fast, and he's like, this is my monster. And the monster's like, good day, sir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cheerio. And just is, like, speaking perfectly fluent Shakespearean, and is like, well, papa. <laughs> he doesn't actually call him papa, but I think that would be hilarious. Well, creator, let me tell you my side of the story. So... Now we get the monster side of the story. And so he left Victor and was just eating berries as one does. Um, he quickly realized that he is deformed and everybody hates him just from the way he looks. Um, he doesn't understand any English um, or the languages that, they, that are around him. He doesn't know how to communicate all of these things. Um, after a while, he is in this little shack. And there's a family nearby, and he becomes really enamored with this family. He does chores for them. They don't know that it's him, but he's, like, chopping wood for them, and he's, like, shoveling their snow and things like that so that they can um, do other things and not have to worry about the things that he can do. Uh, one day he decides that he wants to integrate into this family and be part of the family because they are so happy and they have this support system and he just wants to be part of it. Um, and, oh, I skipped a part. He does learn how to read and how to speak because this stranger comes to visit and stays and she doesn't know the language and so the like son is teaching her how to do this so while he's teaching her he is unknowingly also teaching the monster how to do this so the monster goes in when the old man father is there and the old man father has uh no sight at all and he's like this is the perfect time to do it he won't be able to immediately judge me i'm just gonna get him on my side and then we'll get the kids on our side too um, while he's doing this, he runs out of time and the kid, the kids come back and they, it appears that their father is being attacked by this hideous monster. So they like start beating him and the monster leaves and is like, oh, I, 
I did this all wrong. Like, I shouldn't be mad. I just sprung this on them. I know what I'll do. So he goes back to the house, and um, it turns out that they have moved. They're no longer there, and they just can't stay there when there's another mon- when there's a when there's another monster when there's a monster there trying to attack them so of course our good friend monster is distressed distraught and real sad um so he is like this is my creator's fault this is victor frankenstein's fault and i will find him and he will make this right so on his way to he knows that the village where victor frankenstein came from is to the west he doesn't know exactly where it is but he just starts heading west and on his way there um there's a girl who trips takes a tumble lands in the river in a really strong current and he goes and saves her and his reward is being shot and injured so now he's even more pissed off (laughs) And he continues his journey west. There's a little boy and he's like, this little boy, I'm going to take this little boy who has not been corrupted by, you know, man and expectations and all of these things. And this little boy will be my friend. And so he goes up to the little boy and the little boy is scared, terrified. And he's like, I'm going to get my dad Frankenstein after you. And then the monster's like, excuse me, you're related to Frankenstein. And then he kills him so victor was right his monster did kill his little brother and here we are (laughs) and um our good friend monster is also like i need you to make me a companion i need this to happen because i will either murder everybody in your life friends family maybe you um, or I'll live in a mountain, like, all by myself. So you need to make me a friend. Okay? <laughs> and I think that's where we left off. <laughs> Shall we? We are... ba 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 59%. I know. I know. We still got a long way to go. Okay. Chapter nine. <laughs> the being finished speaking and fixed his looks upon me in expectation of reply. But I was bewildered, perplexed, and unable to arrange my ideas sufficiently to understand the full context of his proposition. He continued. You must create a female for me with whom I can live in the interchange of those sympathies necessary for my being. This you alone can do, and I demand it of you, as a right which you must not refuse. The latter part of his tale had kindled anew in me the anger that had died away while he narrated his peaceful life among the cottagers, and, as he said this, I could no longer suppress the rage that burned within me. I do not... I do refuse it, I replied, and no torture shall ever extort a consent from me. You may render me the most miserable of men, but you shall never make me base in my own eyes. Shall I create another like you, whose joint wickedness might desolate the world? Begone, I have answered you. You may torture me, but I will never consent. You are in the wrong, replied the fiend, and... Instead of threatening, I am content to reason with you. I am malicious because I am miserable. Am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? You, my creator, would tear me to pieces and triumph. Remember that, and tell me why I should pity man more than he pities me. You would not call it murder if you could precipitate me into one of these ice rifts and destroy my frame the work of your own hands. Shall I respect man when he contemns me? Let him live with me in the interchange of kindness, and instead of injury, I would bestow every benefit upon him with tears of gratitude at his acceptance. But that cannot be. The human senses are insurmountable barriers to our union, 
yet mine shall not be the submission of abject slavery i will revenge my injuries if i cannot inspire love i will cause fear and chiefly towards you my arch enemy because my creator do i swear inextinguishable hatred have a care i will work at your destruction nor finish until i desolate your heart so that you curse the hour at your birth a fiendish rage animated him as he said this his face was wrinkled into contortions too horrible for human eyes to behold but presently he calmed himself and proceeded i intend to reason this passion is detrimental to me but for ye detrimental to me for you do not reflect that you are the cause of its excess if any being felt emotions of benevolence towards me i should return them a hundred and a hundredfold for that one creature's sake i would make peace with the whole kind but i now indulge in dreams of bliss that cannot be realized what i ask of you is reasonable and moderate i demand a creature of another sex but as hideous as myself the gratification is small but it is all that i can receive and it shall content me it is true we shall be monsters cut off from all the world but on that account we shall be more attached to one another our lives will be will not be happy but they will be harmless and free from the misery i now feel oh my creator make me happy let me feel gratitude towards you for one benefit let me see that i excite the sympathy of some existing thing do not deny me my request i was moved i shuddered when i thought of the possible consequences of my consent but i felt that there was some justice in his argument his tale and the feelings he now expressed proved him to be a creature of fine sensations and did i not as his maker owe him all the portion of happiness that it was in my power to d to bestow he saw my change of feeling and continued hashtag words are hard yes <laughs> i live and die by that hashtag <laughs> if you consent neither you nor any other human being shall ever see us again i will go to the vast wilds of south america my food is not that of man i do not destroy the lamb and the kid to glut my appetite acorns and berries afford me sufficient nourishment my companion will be of the same n nature as myself and will be content with the same fare we shall make our bed of dried leaves the sun will shine on us as on man and will ripen our food the picture i present to you is peaceful and human and you must feel that you could deny it only in the wantonness of power and cruelty Pit pitiless as you have been towards me i now see compassion in your eyes let me seize the favourable moment and persuade you to promise what i so ardently desire talks a lot yes <laughs> you propose replied i to fly from the habitations of man to dwell in those wilds where the beasts of the field will be your only companions how can you who long for the love and sympathy of man persevere in this exile you will return and again seek their kindness and you will meet with their de detestation your evil passions will be renewed and you will then have a companion to aid you in the task of destruction this may not be cease to argue the point for i cannot consent how inconsistent your feelings are but a moment ago you were moved by my representations and why do you again harden yourself to my complaints I swear to you, by the earth which I inhabit, and by you that made me, that, with the companion you bestow, I will quit the neighborhood of man and dwell, as it may chance, in the most savage of places. My evil passions will have fled, for I shall meet with sympathy. 
My life will flow quietly away, and in my dying moments I shall not curse my maker. His words had a strange effect upon me. I compassionated him. That is what that word says. I did not make up that word. I compassionated him and sometimes felt a wish to console him. But when I looked upon him, when I saw the filthy mass that moved and talked, my heart sickened, and my feelings were altered to those of horror and hatred. I tried to stifle these, stifle these sensations. I thought that I, as I could not sympathize with him, I had no right to withhold from him the small portion of happiness which was yet in my power to bestow. You swear, I said, to be harmless, but have you not already shown a degree of malice that should reasonably make me distrust you? May not even this be a fate, faint that will increase your triumph by affording a wider scope for your revenge? How is this? I thought I had moved your compassion, and yet you still refuse to bestow on me the only benefit that can soften my heart and render me harmless. If I have no ties and no affections, hatred and vice must be my portion. The love of another will destroy the cause of my crimes, and I shall become a thing of whose existence every one will be ignorant. My vices are the children of a forced solitude that I abhor, and my virtues will necessarily arise when I live in communion with an equal. I shall feel the affections of a sensitive being, and become linked to the chain of existence and events, from which I am now excluded. I paused some time to reflect on all he had related, and the various arguments which he had employed. I thought of the promise of virtues which he had displayed on the opening of his existence, and the subsequent blight of all kindly feeling by the loathing and scorn which his protectors had manifested towards him. His power and threats were not omitted in my calculations. A creature who could exist in the ice caves of the glacier and hide himself from pursuit among the ridges of inaccessible precipices was a being possessing faculties it would be vain to cope with. After a long pause of reflection, I concluded that the justice due both to him and my fellow creatures demanded of me that I should comply with his request. Turning to him, therefore, I said, I consent to your demand on your solemn oath to quit Europe forever and every other place in the neighborhood of man, as long as I shall deliver into your hands a female who will accompany you in your exile. I swear, he cried, by the sun and by the blue sky of heaven, that if you grant my prayer, while they exist, you shall never behold me again. Depart to your home and commence your labors. I shall watch their progress with unutterable anxiety, and fear not, but that when you are ready I shall appear. Saying this, he suddenly quitted me, fearful, perhaps, of any change in my sentiments. I saw him descend the mountain with greater speed than the flight of an eagle, and quickly lost him among the undulations of the sea of ice. His tail had occupied the whole day, and the sun was upon the verge of the horizons when he departed. I knew that I ought to hasten my descent towards the valley, as I should soon be encompassed in darkness, but my heart was heavy, and my steps slow. The labor of winding among the little paths of the mountains and fixing my feet firmly as I advanced perplexed me. Occupied as I was by the emotions which the occurrences of the day had produced, night was far advanced when I came to the halfway resting place and seated myself beside the fountain. The stars shone at intervals as the clouds passed from over them. The dark pines rose before me, and every here and there a broken tree lay on the ground. It was a scene of wonderful solemnity, and stirred strange thoughts within me. I wept bitterly, and clasping my hands in agony, I exclaimed, Oh, stars and clouds and winds, ye are all about to mock me, if ye really pity me. 
crush sensation and memory let me become as naught but if not depart depart and leave me in darkness these were wild and miserable thoughts but i cannot describe to you how the eternal twinkling of the stars weighed upon me and how i listened to every blast of wind as if it were a dull ugly siroc on its way to consume me morning dawned before i arrived at the village of chamonix but my presence so haggard and strange hardly calmed the fears of my family who had waited the whole night in anxious expectation of my return the following day we returned to geneva the intention of my father in coming had been to divert my mind and to restore me to my lost tranquillity but the medicine had been fatal and unable to account for the excess of misery i suffered i appeared to suffer he hastened to return home hoping the quiet and monotony of a domestic life would by degrees alleviate my sufferings from whatsoever cause they might spring for myself i was passive in all their arrangements and the gentle affection of my beloved elizabeth was inadequate to draw me from the depth of my despair the promise i had made to the demon weighed upon my mind like dante's iron cowl on the heads of the hellish hypocrites all pleasures of earth and sky passed before me like a dream and that thought only had to me the reality of life can you wonder that sometimes a kind of insanity possessed me or that i saw continually about me a multitude of filthy animals inflicting on me incessant torture that often extorted screams and bitter groans by degrees however these feelings became calmed i entered again into the everyday scene of life if not with interest at least with some degree of tranquillity End of volume two. All right, so this last chapter, uh, our good friend Monster is still trying to convince Victor and was like, dude, just make me a friend. I super promise I'm not going to destroy people because I'm going to have a friend and I won't be lonely. I promise. I promise. I promise. Please, 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 please um you'll never see me again i'll go where there are no people no civilization i'm not even gonna you know hurt a goat because i'm just gonna eat acorns and berries and so is my friend my lady friend that you will be making for me and uh victor eventually agrees and <laughs> ever since agreeing he has become a sad sack again and his father is like all right well this vacation didn't work you're no longer happy let's go back home maybe monotony will slowly bring you back to normal and here we are <laughs> All right. And I think there are just three parts. <laughs> yep, there's only three parts. We're on the last part. This is my first time reading, like, actual Mary Shelley Frankenstein, and I am super enjoying it. Had no idea about this whole, like, make me a girlfriend thing. That's interesting. <laughs> Fun fact, Igor first showed up in the third Universal Frankenstein movie, Son of Frankenstein. Interesting. Also, yes, that's how the character's name is spelled, at least the Universal version, with a Y. Ooh. That's fun. All right. Part three. Oh, it literally says in three volumes. So, yes, there's three parts. <laughs> Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus in three volumes. Volume three. Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mold me, man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? Paradise Lost. And that's the same quote that has been at the, the uh, start of each part. We might have to read Paradise Lost. 
All right, fine. Add it to the list. <laughs> Throw it in the pile. Chapter one. Day after day, week after week, passed away on my return to Geneva, and I could not collect the courage to recommence my work. I feared the vengeance of the disappointed fiend, yet I was unable to overcome my repugnance to the task which was enjoined me. I found that I could not compose a female without again devoting several months to profound study and laborious disquisition. I had heard of some discoveries having been made by an English philosopher, the knowledge of which was material to my success, and I sometimes thought of obtaining my father's consent to visit England for this purpose. But I clung to every pretense of delay, and could not resolve to interrupt my returning tranquilly. My health, which had hitherto declined, was now much restored, and my spirits, when unchecked by the memory of my unhappy promise, rose proportionably. My father saw this change with pleasure, and he turned his thoughts toward the best method of eradicating the remains of my melancholy, which every now and then would return by fits, and with a devouring blackness overcast the approaching sunshine. At these moments I took refuge in the most perfect solitude. I passed whole days on the lake alone in a little boat, watching the clouds, and listening to the rippling of the waves, silent and listless. But the fresh air and bright sun seldom failed to restore me to some degree of composure, and, on my return, I met the salutations of my friends with a readier smile and a more cheerful heart. It was after my return from one of these rambles that my father, calling me aside, thus addressed me. I am happy to remark, my dear son, that you have, you have resumed your former pleasures, and seem to be returning to yourself, and yet you are still unhappy, and still avoid our society. For some time I was lost in conjecture as to the cause of this, but yesterday an idea struck me, and if it is well founded, I conjure you to avow it. Reserve on such a point would be not only useless, but draw down treble misery on us all. I trembled violently at this exordium, and my father continued. I confess, my son, that I have always looked forward to your marriage with your cousin as the tie of our domestic comfort and the stay of my declining years. Gross. But they're like a first cousin, so it's okay. No. <laughs> right? From Mean Girls. Because you got your cousins, and then you have your second cousins. Or no. You have your cousins, and then you have your first cousins, and then you have your second cousins. No. No, Karen. That's not how it works. You were attached to each other from your earliest infancy. You studied together and appeared in dispositions and tastes, entirely suited to one another. But so blind is the experience of man, that what I conceive to be the best assistance to my plan may have entirely destroyed it. You, perhaps, regard her as your sister, without any wish that she might become your wife. Nay, you may have met with another whom you may love, and, considering yourself as bound in honour to your cousin, this struggle may occasion the poignant misery which you appear to feel. My dear father, I assure you. No, my dear father, reassure yourself. I love my cousin tenderly and sincerely. I never saw any woman who excited, as Elizabeth does, my warmest admiration and affection. My future hopes and prospects are entirely bound up in the expectation of our union. The expression of your sentiments on this subject, my dear Victor, give me more pleasure than I have for some time experienced. If you feel thus, we shall assuredly be happy, however present events may cast a gloom over us. But it is this gloom, which appears to have taken so strong a hold of your mind, that I wish to dissipate. Tell me, therefore, whether you object to an immediate solemnization of the marriage. We have been unfortunate, and recent events have fallen, have drawn us from that everyday tranquillity befitting my years and infirmities. You are younger, yet I do not suppose 
possessed as you are of a competent fortune that an early marriage would at all interfere with any future plans of honour and utility that you may have formed do not suppose however that i wish to dictate happiness to you or that a delay on your part would cause me any serious uneasiness interpret my words with candour and answer me i conjure you with confidence and sincerity i listened to my father in silence and remained for some time incapable of offering any reply i removed rapidly in my i revolved rapidly in my mind a multitude of thoughts and endeavoured to arrive at some conclusion alas to me the idea of an immediate union with my cousin was one of horror and dismay same but i think for different reasons <laughs> i was bound by a solemn promise which i had not yet fulfilled and dared not break or if i did what manifold miseries might not impend over me and my devoted family could i enter into a festival with this deadly weight yet hanging round my neck and bowing me to the ground i must perform my engagement and let the monster depart with his mate before i allowed myself to enjoy the delight of a union from which i expected peace i remembered also the necessity imposed upon me of either journeying to england or entering into a long correspondence with those philosophers of that country whose knowledge and discoveries were of indispensable use to me in my in my present undertaking the latter method of obtaining the desired intelligence was dilatory and unsatisfactory besides any variation was agreed agreeable to me and I was delighted with the idea of spending a year or two in change of scene and variety of occupation, in absence from my family, during which period some event might happen which would restore me to them in peace and happiness. My promise might be fulfilled, and the monster have departed, or some accident might occur to destroy him and put an end to my slavery forever. These feelings dictated my answer to my father i expressed a wish to visit england but concealing the true reasons for this request i clothed my desires under the guise of wishing to travel and see the world before i sat down for life within the walls of my native town i urged my entreaty with earnestness and my father was easily induced to comply for a most indulgent and less dictatorial parent did not exist upon earth our plan was soon arranged. I should travel to Strasbourg, where Clerval, his good friend, <laughs> would join me. Some short time would be spent in the towns of Holland, and our principal would, and our principal stay would be in England. We should return by France, and it was agreed that the tour should occupy the space of two years. My father pleased himself with the reflection that my union with Elizabeth should take place immediately on my return to Geneva these two years said he will pass swiftly and it will be the last delay that will oppose itself to your happiness and indeed i earnestly desire that period to arrive when we shall all be united and neither hopes or fears arise to disturb our domestic calm i am contented i replied with your arrangement by that time we shall both have become wiser and i hope happier than we at present are i sighed but my father kindly forbo forbore to question me further concerning the cause of my dejection he hoped that new scenes and the amusement of travelling would restore my tranquillity i now made arrangements for my journey but one feeling haunted me which filled me with fear and agitation during my absence i should leave my friends unconscious of the existence of their enemy and unprotected from his attacks exasperated as he might be by my departure but he had promised to follow me wherever i might go and would not accompany me to england this imagination was dreadful in itself but soothing inasmuch as it supposed the safety of my friends I was agonized with the idea of the possibility that the reverse of this might happen. But through the whole period during which I was the slave of my creature, I allowed myself to be governed by the impulses of the moment, 
and my present sensations strongly intimated that the fiend would follow me and exempt my family from the danger of his machinations it was in the latter end of august that i departed to pass two years of exile elizabeth approved of the reasons of my departure and only regretted that she had not the same opportunities of enlarging her experience and cultivating her understanding she wept however as she bade me farewell and entreated me to return happy and tranquil we all said she depend upon you and if you are miserable what must our feelings what must be our feelings man the way people used to talk or at least the way writers used to write dialogue it's a trip it is a trip literally tripping over what they're saying i threw myself into the carriage that was to convey me away hardly know that hardly knowing whither i was going and careless of what was passing around i remembered only and it was with a bitter anguish that i reflected on it to order that my chemical instruments should be packed to go with me for i resolved to fulfil my promise while abroad and return if possible a free man filled with dreary imaginations i passed through many beautiful and majestic scenes but my eyes were fixed and unobserving i could only think of the bourne of my travels and the work which was to occupy me whilst they endured after some days spent in listless indolence during which i traversed many leagues i arrived at strasbourg where i waited two days for clerval he came alas how great was the contrast between us he was alive to every new scene joyful when he saw the beauties of the setting sun and more happy when he beheld it rise and recommence a new day he pointed out to me the shifting colours of the landscape and the appearances of the sky this is what it is to be alive he cried now i enjoy existence but you my dear frankenstein wherefore are you desponding and sorrowful in truth i was occupied by gloomy thoughts and neither saw the descent of the evening star nor the golden sunrise reflected in the rhine and you my friend would be far more amused with the journal of clerval who observed the scenery with an eye of feeling and delight than to listen to my reflections interesting okay it what a great reminder to be like remember we're not here at the time of all of these actions we are reading the writing of somebody who is listening to victor talk and relay all of this so that little like aside like and you my friend addressing who he's talking to <laughs> i just love that little reminder that's so good and i almost like imagine like mary shelley being like remember i put layers to this story for i am clever <laughs> I, a miserable wretch, haunted by a curse that shut up every avenue to enjoyment. We had agreed to descend to, to descend the Rhine in a boat from Strasbourg to Rotterdam, whence we might take shipping for London. During this voyage we passed by many willowy islands and saw several beautiful towns. We stayed a day at Mannheim, and, on the fifth from our departure from Strasbourg, arrived at Mayence. The course of the Rhine below Mayence became much more picturesque. The river descends rapidly, and winds between hills, not high, but steep and of beautiful forms. We saw many ruined castles standing on the edges of precipices, surrounded by black woods, high and inaccessible this part of the rhine indeed represents a singularly variegated landscape in one spot you view rugged hills ruined castles overlooking tremendous precipices with the dark rhine rushing beneath and on the sudden turn of a promontory flourishing vineyards with green sloping banks and a meandering river and populous towns 
occupy the scene. We traveled at the time of the vintage and heard the songs of the laborers as we glided down the stream. Even I, depressed in mind and my spirits continually agitated by gloomy feelings, even I was pleased. I lay at the bottom of the boat, and, as I gazed at the cloudless, blue sky, I seemed to drink in a tranquility to which I had long been a stranger. And if these were my sensations, who can describe those of Henry? Henry is Clerval. It has taken me far too long to make that connection, but Clerval and Henry are the same friend. <laughs> I don't know why we don't just stick with one name, and we just we just love calling him both names, but not ever saying that they're both the same person. You just gotta remember that. <laughs> he felt as if he had been transported to fairyland, and enjoyed a happiness seldom tasted by man. I have seen, he said, the most beautiful scenes of my own country. I have visited the lakes of Lucerne and Uri, where the snowy mountains descend almost perpendicularly to the water, casting black and impenetrable shades, which would cause a gloomy and mournful appearance were it not for the most verdant islands that relieve the eye by their happy appearance." I have seen this lake agitated by a tempest, when the wind tore up whirlwinds of water, and gave you an idea of what the waterspout must be on the great ocean, and the waves dash with fury the base of the mountain, where the priest and his mistress were overwhelmed by an avalanche, and where their dying voices are still said to be heard amid the pauses of the nightly wind. I have seen the mountains of La... Valais and Pace de Vaud. But this country, Victor, pleases me more than all those wonders. The mountains of Switzerland are more majestic and strange, but there is a charm in the banks of this divine river that I never before saw equaled. Look at that castle which overhangs yon precipice, and that also on the island, almost concealed amongst the foliage of those lovely trees and now that group of laborers coming from among their vines, and that village half hid in the recesses of the mountain. Oh, surely the spirit that inhabits the gar and guards this place has a soul more in harmony with man than those who pile the glacier, or retire to the inaccessible peaks of the mountains of our own country. Clerval, beloved friend, even now it delights me to record your words and to dwell on the praises of which you are so eminently deserving. He was a being formed in the very poetry of nature. He was wild and enthusiastic. Imagination was chastened by the sensibility of his heart. His soul overflowed with ardent affections, and his friendship was of that devoted and wondrous nature that the worldly-minded teach us to look for only in the imagination. But even human sympathies were not sufficient to satisfy his eager mind. The scenery of external nature, which others regard only with admiration, he loved with ardor. The sounding cataract haunted him like a passion, the tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood. Their colors and their forms were, then to him, an appetite, a feeling and a love that had no need of remoter charm. By thought, supplied or any in interest, unborrowed from the eye. And where does he now exist? Is this gentle and lovely being lost forever? Has his mind so replete the ideas, imaginations, fanciful and magnificent, which formed a world whose existence depended on the life of its creator? Has his mind perished? Does it now only exist in my memory? No, it is not thus. Your form so divinely wrought, and beaming with beauty, has decayed, but your spirit still visits and consoles your unhappy friend. Pardon this gush of sorrow. These ineffectual words are but a slight tribute to the unexampled worth of Henry. But they soothe my heart, overflowing with the anguish which his remembrance creates. I will proceed with my tale. 
Please do so, Victor. Beyond Cologne, we descended to the plains of Holland, and we resolved to post the remainder of our, of our way, for the wind was contrary, and the stream of the river was too gentle to aid us. Our journey here lost the interest arising from beautiful scenery, but we arrived in a few days at Rotterdam, whence we proceeded by sea to England. It was on a clear morning, in the latter days of December, that I first saw the white cliffs of Britain. The banks of the Famies presented a new scene. They were flat but fertile, and almost every town was marked by the remembrance of some story. We saw Tilbury Fort, and remembered the Spanish Armada, Gravesend, Woolwich, and Greenwich, places which I had heard of even in my country. At length we saw the numerous steeples of London. Oops. Yeah, okay. At length we saw the numerous steeples of London, St. Paul's towering above all, and the tower famed in English history. For some reason they swap names for the Universal Meeting, for the Universal Movie, and Frankenstein's name in it is Henry, while his friend's name is Victor. Interesting. Why? What a weird... That's a weird choice to make. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I love all these fun facts. Keep them coming. That was the end of chapter one. That, chapter one. Part three, chapter one. Let us not forget that we have made progress. Okay, so in this chapter... Um, Victor's dad is like, dude, you're still really sad. I know what will make you happy. Or, rather, I think I know what's making you sadder. Um, you, you haven't married your cousin yet. And maybe you, you know that you need to marry your cousin and you found somebody else and you just can't tell us. And Victor's like, no, no, there's nobody else. I, sure, I'll marry my cousin. She, she makes me feel warm and fuzzy and wonderful. Um, but first, I need to, like, travel. I need to, like, do something, okay? It's gonna take me a couple years. I'm gonna go on sabbatical. Nothing too crazy. Um, when reality, Victor can't even, like, think about marrying his cousin Elizabeth yet because he has to make the the female monster so that his creation can scurry off <laughs> and like leave everybody alone um so like that's why he's so so upset and like so anxiety ridden but he knows that like if he gets married now that he's like putting off work and that the monster is gonna see this and be like dude you're not upholding your promise my friend so victor's like i'm gonna leave i'm gonna go to england i have to do it papa you have to let me and that is where he's going to be, like, continuing his work, hopefully finishing soon, and then returning, and then living a happy life with Elizabeth. <laughs> All right. Part three. Chapter two. London was our present point of rest. We determined to remain several months in this wonderful and celebrated city, Clerval decided, desired the intercourse of the man of genius and talent who flourished at this time, but this was with me a secondary object. I was principally occupied with the means of obtaining the information necessary for the completion of my promise, and quickly availed myself of the letters of introduction that I had brought with me, addressed to the most distinguished natural philosophers. If this journey had taken place during my days of study and happiness, it would have afforded me inexpressible pleasure. But a blight had come over my existence, and I only visited these people for the sake of the information they might give me on the subject in which my interest was so terribly profound. Company was irksome to me. Same. <laughs> when alone, I could fill my mind with the sights of heaven and earth. The voice of Henry soothed me, and I could thus cheat myself into a transitory peace. But busy, uninteresting, joyous faces brought back despair to my heart. I saw an insurmountable barrier placed between me and my fellow men. This barrier was sealed with the blood of William and Justine, 
and to reflect on the events connected with those names filled my soul with anguish. Okay, William is his dead brother. Justine is the girl who took the fall for his murder. Couldn't remember their names. There they are. William and Justine. But in Clerval, I saw the image of my former self. He was inquisitive and anxious to gain experience and instruction. The difference of manners which he observed was to him an inexhaustible source of instruction and amusement. He was forever busy, and the only check to his enjoyments was my sorrowful and dejected mane. I tried to conceal this as much as possible, that I might not debar him from the pleasures natural to one who was entering on a new scene of life, undisturbed by any care or bitter recollection. I often refused to accompany him, alleging another engagement that I might remain alone. I now also began to collect the materials necessary for my new creation, and this was to me like a torture of single drops of water continually falling on my head. Every thought that was devoted to it was in extreme anguish, and every word that I spoke in allusion to it caused my lips to quiver and my heart to palpitate. After passing some months in London, we received a letter from a person in Scotland who had formerly been our visitor at Geneva. He mentioned the beauties of his native country, and asked us if those were not sufficient allurements to induce us to prolong our journey as far north as Perth, where he resided. Clerval eagerly desired to accept this invitation, and I, although I abhorred society, wished to view again mountains and streams and all the wondrous works with which nature adorns her chosen dwelling places. We arrived in England at the beginning of October, and it was now February. We accordingly determined to commence our journey towards the north at the expiration of another month. In this expedition, we did not intend to follow the great road to Edinburgh, but to visit Windsor, Oxford, Matlock, and the Cumberland Lakes, resolving to arrive at the completion of this tour about the end of July. I packed my chemical instruments and the materials I had collected, resolving to finish my labors in some obscure nook in the northern highlands of Scotland. We quitted London on the 27th of March and remained a few days at Windsor, rambling in its beautiful forest. This was a new scene to us mountaineers, the majestic oaks, the quantity of game, and the herds of stately deer were all novelties to us. From thence we proceeded to Oxford. As we entered this city, our minds were filled with the remembrance of the events that had been transacted there more than a century and a half before. It was here that Charles I had collected his forces. This city had remained faithful to him, after the whole notion, after the whole nation had forsaken his cause to join the standard of Parliament and liberty. The memory of that unfortunate king and his companions, the amiable Falkland, the insolent Gower, his queen and son, gave a peculiar interest to every part of the city, which they might be supposed to have inhabited. The spirit of elder days found a dwelling here, and we delighted to trace its footsteps. If these feelings had not found an imaginary gratification, the appearance of the city had yet in itself sufficient beauty to obtain our admiration. The colleges are ancient and picturesque, the streets are almost magnificent, and the lovely Isis which flows beside it through meadows of exquisite verdure is spread forth into a placid expanse of waters, which reflects its majestic assemblage of towers and spires and domes, embosomed among aged trees. I enjoyed this scene, and yet my enjoyment was embittered both by the memory of the past and the anticipation of the future. I was formed for peaceful happiness. During my youthful days, discontent never visited my mind, and if I was ever overcome by ennui, the sight of what is beautiful in nature, or the study of what is excellent and sublime in the productions of man, could always interest my heart, and communicate elasticity to my spirits. But I am a blasted tree, 
the bolt has entered my soul and i felt then that i should survive to exhibit what i shall soon cease to be a miserable spectacle of wrecked humanity pitiable to others and abhorrent to myself we passed a considerable period at oxford rambling among its environs and endeavouring to identify every spot which might relate to the most animating epoch of english history our little voyages of discovery were often prolonged by these successive objects that presented themselves we visited the tomb of the illustrious hampton and the field on which that patriot fell for a moment my soul was elevated from its debasing and miserable fears to contemplate the divine ideas of liberty and self-sacrifice of which these sites were the monuments and the remembrances the remembrancers excuse me for an instant i dared to shake off my chains and look around me with a free and lofty spirit but the iron had eaten into my flesh and i sank again trembling and hopeless into my miserable self we left oxford with regret and proceeded to matlock which was our next place of rest the country in the neighbourhood of this village resembled to a greater degree the scenery of switzerland but everything is on a lower scale and the green hills want the crown of distant white alps which always attend on the piney mountains of my native country we visited the wondrous cave and the little cabinets of natural history where the curiosities are disposed in the same manner as in the collections of serva and chaminot chamini chamini that's what it is <laughs> the latter name made me tremble when pronounced by henry and i hastened to quit matlock with, with which that terrible scene was thus associated from derby still journeying northward we passed two months in cumberland and westmoreland i could now almost fancy myself among the swiss mountains the little patches of snow which yet lingered on the northern sides of the mountains the lakes and the dashing of the rocky streams were all familiar and dear sights to me here also we made some acquaintances who almost contrived to cheat me into happiness the delight of clerval was proportionably greater than mine his mind expanded in the company of men of talent and he found in his own nature greater capacities and resources than he could have imagined himself to have possessed while he associated with his inferiors i could pass my life here said he to me and among these mountains i should scarcely regret switzerland and the rhine but he found that a traveller's life is one that includes much pain amidst its enjoyments his feelings are for ever on the stretch and when he begins to sink into repose he finds himself obliged to quit that on which he rests in pleasure for something new which again engages his intention and which also he forsakes for other novelties i had scarcely visited the various lakes of cumberland and westmoreland and conceived in affection for some of the inhabitants when the period of our appointment with our scotch friend approached and we left them to travel on for my own part i was not sorry i had now neglected my promise for some time and i feared the effects of my of the demon's disappointment he might remain in switzerland and wreak his vengeance on my relatives this idea pursued me and tormented me at every moment from which i might otherwise have snatched repose and peace i waited for my letters with feverish impatience if they were delayed i was miserable and overcame by a thousand fears and when they arrived and i saw the superscription of elizabeth or my father i hardly dared to read and ascertain my fate sometimes i thought that the fiend followed me and might ex expedite my remissness by murdering my companion when these thoughts possessed me i would not quit henry for a moment but followed him as his shadow to protect him from the fancied range of his destroyer i felt as if i had committed some great crime the consciousness of which haunted me i was guiltless but i had indeed drawn down a horrible curse upon my head as mortal as that of crime 
I visited Edinburgh with languid eyes and mind, and yet that city might have interested the most unfortunate being. Clerval did not like it so well as Oxford, for the antiquity of the latter city was more pleasing to him. But the beauty and regularity of the new town of Edinburgh, its romantic castle, and its environs, and the most delightful in the world, off Arthur's seat, St. Bernard's Well, and the Pan Pentland Hills, compensated him for the change, and filled him with a cheerfulness and admiration. But I was impatient to arrive at the termination of my journey. Okay, let me just say that Edinburgh is, like, one of the best places ever, and I can't believe that Clerval is like, mm, Oxford's better. Like, you're wrong. <laughs> you are actually wrong. We left Edinburgh in a week, passing through Cupar, St. Andrews, and along the banks of the Tay to Perth, where our friend expected us. But I was in no mood to laugh and talk with strangers, or enter into their feelings or plans with the good humor expected from a guest, and accordingly I told Clerval that I wished to make the tour of Scotland alone. "'Do you,' said I, "'enjoy yourself, and, and let this be our rendezvous. I may be absent a month or two, but do not interfere with my motions. I entreat you, leave me to peace and solitude for a short time, and when I return I hope it will be with a lighter heart.' more congenial to your own temper. Henry wished to dissuade me, but, seeing me bend on this plan, ceased to remonstrate. He entreated me to write often. I had rather be with you, he said, in your solitary rambles than with these Scotch people whom I do not know. Hasten, then, my dear friend, to return, that I may again feel myself somewhat at home, which I cannot do in your absence. Having parted from my friend, I determined to visit some remote spot of Scotland, and finish my work in solitude. I did not doubt, but that the monster followed me, and would discover himself to me when I should have finished, that he might receive his companion. With this resolution I traversed the northern highlands, and fixed on one of the remotest of the Orkneys as the scene labours. It was a place fitted for such a work, being hardly more than a rock, whose high sides were continually beaten upon by the waves. The soil was barren, scarcely affording pasture for a few miserable cows and oatmeal for its inhabitants, which consisted of five persons whose gaunt and scraggy limbs gave tokens of their miserable fare. Vegetables and bread, when they indulged in such luxuries, and even fresh water was to be procured by the mainland, which was about five miles distant. On the whole island there were but three miserable huts, and one of these was vacant when I arrived. This I hired. It contained but two rooms, and these exhibited all the squalidness of the most miserable penury. The thatch had fallen in, the walls were unplastered and the door was off its hinges. I ordered it to be repaired, bought some furniture, and took possession, an incident which would, doubtless, have occasioned some surprise, had not all the senses of the cottagers been benumbed by want and squalid poverty. As it was, I lived ungazed at and unmolested, hardly thanked for the pittance of food and clothes which I gave, so much does suffering blunt even the coarsest sensations of men. In this retreat I devoted the morning to labor, but in the evening, when the weather permitted, I walked on the stony beach of the sea to listen to the waves as they roared and dashed at my feet. It was a monotonous yet ever-changing scene. I thought of Switzerland. It was far different from this desolate and appalling landscape, its hills are covered with vines, and its cottages are scattered thickly in the plains. Its fair lakes reflect a blue and gentle sky, and, when troubled by the winds, their tumult is but as the play of a lively infant when compared to the roarings of the giant ocean. In this manner I distributed my occupations when I first arrived, but, as I proceeded in my labor, 
It became every day more horrible and irksome to me. Sometimes I could not prevail on myself to enter my laboratory for several days, and at other times I toiled day and night in order to complete my work. It was, indeed, a filthy process in which I was engaged. During my first experiment, a kind of enthusiastic friend frenzy had blinded me to the horror of my employment. My mind was intently fixed on the sequel of my labor, and my eyes were shut to the horror of my proceedings. But now I went to it in cold blood, and my heart often sickened at the work of my hands. Thus situated, employed in the most detestable occupation, immersed in a solitude where nothing could for an instant call my attention from the actual scene in which I was engaged, my spirits became unequal. I grew restless and nervous. Every moment I feared to meet my prosecutor. Sometimes I sat with my eyes fixed on the ground, fearing to raise them lest they should encounter the object which I so much dreaded to behold. I feared to wander from the sight of my fellow creatures, lest, when alone, he should come to claim his companion. In the meantime, I worked on, and my labor was already considerably advanced. I looked towards its completion with a tremulous and eager hope which I dared not trust myself to question, but which was intermixed with obscure forebodings of evil that made my heart sicken in my chest. End of chapter two. Okay, so in this one, we have Victor and Henry off gallivanting. Well, Henry is gallivanting. Henry is having the time of his life. He is loving travel they're going to all this, these very beautiful places and he's just super loving it and they get a letter from somebody who is up in perth and is like excuse me come visit me i'm wonderful and would love to talk with you and clerval is like yeah let's go and victor's like i mean i guess i don't like people and i don't want to entertain anybody but sure so they're traveling they're in um scotland looking at beautiful things. They're in Edinburgh, all these wonderful scenic uh, descriptions. And Victor is like, okay, go have fun. Go meet this person that I don't know and have fun in Perth. I'm, I will meet you. This will be our meeting place right here. And Clerval is like, okay, but I mean, it would be more fun if you were there. Like, I don't even know these people, but all right. And then Victor is like okay bye have fun and then just starts working on his project again knowing that the monster probably followed him and is watching him and is just riddled with the anxiety that like maybe the monster is going to become impatient and like murder his family or maybe he's following him and sees that he's not actively working on his project every single day and maybe he's going to take it out on Clerval so he's constantly dealing with all of this stress and he's like I'm I need the time I need the time to do this I'm going to work on my project in silence in solitude in Edinburgh which I feel like Edinburgh is like a a beautiful place. I feel like a lot of authors live there. And sure, why not mad scientists? Why not throw them in the lot, you know? <laughs> it makes sense. It makes sense. All right. Chapter three. I was working in the lab when... <laughs> I'm just kidding. I sat one evening in my laboratory. The sun had set, and the moon was just rising from the sea. I had not sufficient light for my employment, and I remained idle, in a pause of consideration of whether I should leave my labor for the night, or hasten its conclusion by an unremitting attention to it. As I sat, a train of reflection occurred to me, which led me to consider the effects of what I was now doing. These years before I was engaged in the same manner, and had created a fiend whose unparalleled barbarity, barbarity had desolated my heart and filled it forever with the bitterest remorse, I was now about to form another being, of whose dispositions I was alike ignorant. She might become ten thousand times more malignant than her mate, and delight 
for its own sake, in murder and wretchedness. He had sworn to quit the neighborhood of man and hide himself in, de in deserts, and she had not. And she, who in all probability was to become a thinking and reasoning animal, might refuse to comply with the, com with the compact made before her creation. They might even hate each other. The creature who already lived loathed his own deformity, and might he not conceive a greater abhorrence for it when it came before his eyes in the female form? She also might turn with disgust from him to the superior beauty of man. She might quit him, and he be again alone, exasperated by the fresh provocation of being deserted by one of his own species. Even if they were to leave Europe and inhabit the deserts of the New World, yet one of the first results of those sympathies for which the demon thirsted would be children, and a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth, who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. Had I a right, for my own benefit, to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? I had before been moved by the sophism of the being I had created. I had been struck senseless by his fiendish threats. But now, for the first time, the wickedness of my promise burst upon me. I shuddered to think that future ages might curse me as their pest, whose selfishness had not hesitated to buy its own peace at the price, perhaps, of the existence of the whole human race. I trembled, and my heart failed within me, when, on looking up, I saw, by the light of the moon, the demon at the casement. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me, where I sat fulfilling the task which he had allotted to me. Yes, he had followed me in my travels. He had loitered in forests, hid himself in caves, or taken refuge in wide and desert heaths. And he now came to mark my progress and claim the fulfillment of my promise. So... The logistics of Frankenstein doing his work not, like, on the go. Well, I guess he's in his laboratory. Okay, never mind. I was going to say, like, is he just, like, shoving body parts into his suitcase? Like, what's happening? How is he able to travel and do his work? But he left. Okay. I answered my own question. Never mind. Pretend I never interrupted. As I looked on him, his countenance expressed the utmost extent of malice and treachery. I thought with a sensation of madness on my promise of creating another like him, and, trembling with passion, tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. The wretch saw me destroy the creature on whose future existence he depended for happiness, and, with a howl of devilish despair and revenge, withdrew. I left the room, and, locking the door, made a solemn vow in my own heart never to resume my labors. And then, with trembling steps, I sought my own apartment. I was alone. None were near me to dissipate the gloom, and relieve me from the sickening oppression of the most terrible reveries. Several hours passed, and I remained near my window gazing on the sea. It was almost motionless for the winds were hushed, and all nature reposed under the eye of the quiet moon. A few fishing vessels alone specked the water, and now and then the gentle breeze wafted the sound of voices as the fishermen called to one another. I felt the silence, although I was hardly conscious of its extreme profundity until my ear was suddenly arrested by the paddling of oars near the shore, and a person landed close to my house. In a few minutes after, I heard the creaking of my door, as if someone endeavored to open it softly. I trembled from head to foot. I felt a presentiment of who it was, and wished to rouse one of the peasants who dwelt in the cottage not far from mine. 
but i was overcome by the sensation of helplessness so often felt in frightful dreams when you in vain endeavour to fly from an impending danger and was rooted to the spot presently i heard the sound of footsteps along the passage the door opened and the wretch whom i dreaded appeared shutting the door he approached me and said in a smothered voice you have destroyed the work which you began what is it that you intend do you dare to break your promise i have endured toil and misery i left switzerland with you i crept along the shores of the rhine along among its willow islands and over the summits of its hills i have dwelt many months in the heaths of england and among the deserts of scotland i have endured incalculable fatigue and cold and hunger do you dare destroy my hopes be gone i do break my promise never will i create another like yourself equal in deformity and wickedness slave i before reasoned with you but you have proved yourself unworthy of my condensation remember that i have power you believe yourself miserable but i can make you so wretched that the light of day will be hateful to you you are my creator but i am your master obey Ooh, i like that that's a cool line you are my creator but i am your master obey wild 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 the hour of my weakness is past and the period of your power is arrived your threats cannot move me to do an act of wickedness but they confirm me in a resolution of not creating you a companion in vice shall i in cold blood set loose upon the earth a demon whose delight is in death and wretchedness be gone i am firm and your words will only exasperate my rage the monster saw my determination in my face and gnashed his teeth in the impotence of anger shall each man cried he find a wife for his bosom and each beast have his mate and i be alone i had feelings of affection and they were requited by detestation and scorn man you may hate but beware your hours will pass in dread and misery and soon the bolt will fall which must ravish from you your happiness forever are you to be happy while i grovel in the intensity of my wretchedness you can blast my other passions but revenge remains revenge henceforth dearer than light or food i may die but first you my tyrant and tormentor shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery beware for i am fearless and therefore powerful i will watch with the willy wiliness of a snake that i may sting with its venom man you shall repent of the injuries you inflict devil cease do not poison the air with these sounds of malice i have declared my resolution to you and i am no coward to bend beneath the words leave me i am inexorable i am inexorable it is well i go but remember i shall be with you on your wedding night terrifying um okay i started forward and exclaimed villain before you sign my death warrant be sure that you are yourself safe i would have seized him but he eluded me and quitted the house with precipitation in a few moments i saw him in his boat which shot across the waters with an arrowy swiftness and was soon lost amidst the waves all was again silent but his words rung in my ears i burned with rage to pursue the murderer of my peace and precipitate him into the ocean i walked up and down my room hastily and perturbed while my imagination conjured up a thousand images to torment and sting me why had i not followed him and closed with him in a mortal strife but i had suffered him to depart and he had directed his course towards the mainland i shuddered to think who might be the next victim sacrificed to his insatiate revenge and then i thought of his words again I will be with you on your wedding night that then was the period fixed for the fulfilment 
of my destiny. In that hour I should, I should die, and at once satisfy and extinguish his malice. The prospect did not move me to fear, yet when I thought of my beloved Elizabeth, of her tears and endless sorrow, when she should find her lover so barbarously snatched from her, tears, the first I had shed for many months, streamed from my eyes, and I resolved not to fall before my enemy without a bitter struggle. The night passed away, and the sun rose from the ocean. My feelings became calmer, if it may be called calmness, when the violence of rage sinks into the depths of despair. I left the house, a horrid scene of the last night's contention, and walked on the beach of the sea, which I almost regarded as an insuperable barrier between me and my fellow creatures. Nay, a wish that such should prove the fact stole across me. I desired that I might pass my life on that barren rock, warily, it is true, but uninterrupted by any sudden shock of misery. If I returned, it was to be sacrificed, or to see those whom I most loved die under the grasp of a demon whom I had myself created. I walked about the isle like a restless spectre, separated from all it loved, and miserable in the separation. When it became noon, and the sun rose higher, I lay down on the grass, and was overpowered by a deep sleep. I had been awake the whole of the preceding night, my, ner my nerves were agitated, and my eyes inflamed by watching the misery. The sleep into which I now sunk refreshed me, and when I awoke I again felt as if I belonged to a race of human beings like myself, and I began to reflect upon what had passed with greater composure. Yet still, the words of the fiend rung in my ears like a death knell. They appeared like a dream, yet distant and oppressive as a reality. The sun had far descended, and I sat and I still sat on the shore, satisfying my appetite, which had become ravenous, with an oaten cake, when I saw a fishing boat land close to me, and one of the men brought me a packet. It contained letters from Geneva, and one from Clerval, entreating me to join him. He said that nearly a year had elapsed since we had quitted Switzerland, and France was yet unvisited. It's been a year? Jeez. He entreated me, therefore, to leave my solitary isle and meet him in, at Perth in a week from that time, when we might arrange the plan of our future proceedings. This letter, in a degree, recalled me to life, and I determined to quit my island at the expiration of two days. Yet before I departed, there was a task to perform, on which I shuddered to reflect. I must pack my chemical instruments, and for that purpose I must enter the room which had been the scene of my odious work, and I must handle those utensils, the sight of which was sickening to me. The next morning at daybreak I summoned sufficient courage, and unlocked the door of my laboratory. The remains of the half-finished creature whom I had destroyed— lay scattered on the floor, and I almost felt as if I had mangled the living flesh of a human being. I paused to collect myself, and then entered the chamber. With trembling hand, I conveyed the instruments out of the room. But I reflected that I ought not to leave the relics of my work to excite the horror and suspicion of the peasants, and I accordingly put them into a basket, with a great quantity of stones, and laying them up, determined to throw them into the sea that very night, and in the meantime I sat upon that beach, employed in cleaning and arranging my chemical apparatus. Nothing could be more complete than the alteration that had taken place in my feelings since the night of the appearance of the demon. I had before regarded my promise with a gloomy despair as a thing that, with whatever consequences, must be fulfilled. But I now felt as if a film had been taken from before my eyes, and that I, for the first time, saw clearly. 
the idea of renewing my labors did not for one instant occur to me the threat i had heard weighed on my thoughts but i did not reflect that a voluntary act of mine could avert it i had resolved in my own mind that to create another like the fiend i had first made would be an act of the basest and most atrocious selfishness and i banished from my mind every thought that could lead to a different conclusion between two and three in the morning the moon rose and i then putting my basket aboard a little skiff sailed out about four miles from the shore the scene was perfectly solitary a few boats were returning towards land but i sailed away from them i felt as if i was about the commission of a dreadful crime and avoided with shuddering anxiety any encounter with my fellow creatures at one time the moon which had before been clear was suddenly overspread by a thick cloud and i took advantage of the moment of darkness and cast my basket into the sea i listened to the gurgling sound as it sunk and then sailed away from the spot the sky became clouded but the air was pure although chilled by the northeast breeze that was then rising but it refreshed me and filled me with such agreeable sensations that i resolved to prolong my stay on the water and fixing the rudder in a direct position stretched myself at the bottom of the boat clouds hid the moon everything was obscure and i heard only the sound of the boat as its keel cut through the waves the murmur lulled me and in a short time i slept soundly i do not know how long i remained in this situation but when i awoke i found that the sun had already mounted considerably the wind was high and the waves continually threatened the safety of my little skiff i found that the wind was northeast and must have driven me far from the coast from which i had embarked i had endeavoured to change my course but quickly found that if i again made the attempt the boat would be instantly filled with water thus situated my only resource was to drive before the wind i confess that i felt a few sensations of terror i had no compass with me and was so little acquainted with the geography of this part of the world that the sun was of little benefit to me i might be driven into the wide atlantic and feel all the tortures of starvation or be swallowed up in the immeasurable waters that roared and buffeted around me i had already been out many hours and felt the torment of a burning thirst a prelude to my other sufferings i looked on the heavens which were covered by clouds that flew before the wind only to be replaced by others i looked upon the sea it was to be my grave fiend i exclaimed your task is already fulfilled i thought of elizabeth of my father and of clerval and sunk into a reverie so despairing and frightful that even now when the scene is on the point of closing before me for ever i shudder to reflect on it some hours passed thus but by degrees as the sun declined towards the horizon the wind died away into a gentle breeze and the sea became free from breakers but these gave place to a heavy swell i felt sick and hardly able to hold the rudder when suddenly i saw a line of highland high land towards the south almost spent as i was by fatigue and the dreadful suspense i endured for several hours this sudden certainty of life rushed like a flood of warm joy to my heart and tears gushed from my eyes how mutable are our feelings and how strange is that clinging love we have of life even in the excess of misery i constructed an, another sail with a part of my dress and eagerly steered my course towards the land it had a wild and rocky appearance but as i approached nearer i easily perceived the traces of cultivation i saw vessels near the shore and found myself suddenly transported back to the neighbourhood of civilised man i eagerly chased i eagerly traced the windings of the land and hailed a steeple which i at length saw ensuing issuing from behind a small 
promontory as I was in a state of extreme debility I resolved to sail directly towards the town as a place where I could most easily procure nourishment. Fortunately, I had money with me. As I turned the promontory, I perceived a small, neat town and a good harbor, which I entered, my heart bounding with joy at my unexpected escape. As I was occupied in fixing the boat and arranging the sails, several people crowded towards the spot. They seemed very much surprised at my appearance, but, instead of offering me any assistance, whispered together with gestures that at any other time might have produced in me a slight sensation of alarm. As it was, I merely remarked that they spoke English, and I therefore addressed them in that language. "'My good friends,' said I, "'will you be so kind as to tell me the name of this town, and inform me where I am?' "'You will know that soon enough,' replied a man with a, gruff, a gruff voice. "'Maybe you are come to a place that will not prove much to your taste, but you will not be consulted as to your quarters, I promise you.' I was exceedingly surprised on receiving so rude an answer from a stranger and I was also disconcerted on perceiving the frowning and angry countenances of his companions. "'Why do you answer me so roughly?' I replied. "'Surely it is not the custom of Englishmen to receive strangers so inhospitably.' "'I do not know,' said the man, "'what the custom of the English may be, but it is the custom of the Irish to hate villains.' "'Ah, oh, we're in Ireland.' With this strange dialogue continued, while this strange dialogue continued, I perceived the crowd rapidly increase. Their faces expressed a mixture of curiosity and anger, which annoyed and in some degree alarmed me. I inquired the way to the inn, but no one replied. I then moved forward, and a murmuring sound arose from the crowd as they followed and surrounded me. When an ill-looking man approached, tapped me on the shoulder, and said, "'Come, sir, you must follow me to Mr. Kerwin's to give an account of yourself.' "'Who is Mr. Kerwin? Why am I to give an account of myself? Is not this a free country?' "'Aye, sir, free enough for honest folks. Mr. Kerwin is a magistrate, and you are to give an account of the death of a gentleman who was found murdered here last night.' what an entrance. <laughs> this answer startled me, but I presently recovered myself. I was innocent. That could easily be proved. Accordingly, I followed my conductor in silence, and was led to one of the best houses in the town. I was ready to sink from fatigue and hunger, but being surrounded by a crowd, I thought it politic to rouse all my strength that no physical debility might be construed into apprehension or conscious guilt. Little did I then expect the calamity that was in a few moments to overwhelm me, and extinguish in horror and despair all fear of ignominy or death. I must pause here, for it requires all my fortitude to recall the memory of the frightful events which I am about to relate in proper detail to my recollection. End of chapter three. All right, so Victor is toiling away. He's so close to actually finishing his second creation and then destroys it, decides, I can't do this. What am I, what am I doing? Like, no, terrible. This could be even worse. Like, we made this promise together, yes, but we didn't make the promise with this lady monster. What if the lady monster is like, well, I love murdering and destroying things, so... Not part of my deal. I'm going to go murder and destroy. Um, so he decides not to do it. And pretty much immediately after he decides not to do it, Frankenstein's monster is like, Hey, bud, remember me? Um, I see that you have destroyed everything and you are going back on our agreement. And Victor's like, hell yeah, I'm going back on our agreement. And the monster's like, all right, well, I'll see you on your wedding day. And then leaves. And Victor is like, all right, cool. He's gone. And then it's like, wait a minute. What did he say? He'll see me on my wedding day. 
that's when he's going to kill me. I'm going to die. I'm going to get married and then I'm going to die. And poor Elizabeth, my soon to be bride, but is also my cousin, will be so distraught at losing me. I can't do that. So then he gets into a boat and just drifts away. Doesn't know where he's going. Just drifts away. Um, and then he sees a site of civilization. He goes up there. Um, everyone's kind of rude and apparently they're just Irish and that's just how Irish are. <laughs> that's what it seemed to be depicting in this. But really there was also a murder. So they're like, hey, friend, you need to go and uh, defend yourself against this magistrate because there was a murder here last night and we don't know who you are. And Victor's like, well, that's easy enough. I will do this because I am innocent. And uh, that's where we left off. Bum, bum, bum. Four funerals and a wedding. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. Very much so. All right. Chapter four. I was soon introduced into the presence of the magistrate, an old benevolent man with calm and mild manners. He looked upon me, however, with some degree of severity, and then, turning towards my conductors, he asked who appeared as witness on this occasion. About a half a dozen men came forward, and one being selected by the magistrate, he disposed that he had been out fishing the night before with his son and brother-in-law, Daniel Nugent, when, about ten o'clock, they observed a strong northerly blast rising, and they accordingly put in for port. It was a very dark night. As the moon had not yet risen, they did not land at the harbor, but, as they had been accustomed, at a creek about two miles below. He walked on first, carrying a part of the fishing tackle, and his companions followed him at some distance. As he was proceeding along the sands, he struck his foot against something, and fell all his length on the ground. His companions came up to assist him, and, by the light of their lantern, they found that he had fallen on the body of a man who was, to all appearances, dead. Their first supposition was that it was the corpse of some person who had been drowned and was thrown on shore by the waves. But, upon examination, they found that the clothes were not wet, and even that the body was not then cold. They instantly carried it to the cottage of an old woman near the spot, and endeavored, but in vain, to restore it to life. He appeared to be a handsome young man, about five and twenty years of age. He was apparently, he had apparently been strangled, for there was no sign of any violence except the black mark of fingers on his neck. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> the first part of this deposition did not in the least interest me, but when the mark of the fingers was mentioned, I remembered the murder of my brother, and felt myself extremely agitated. My limbs trembled, and a mist came over my eyes, which obliged me to lean on a chair for support. The magistrate observed me with a keen eye, and of course drew an unfavorable augury from my manner. The son confirmed his father's account, but when Daniel Nugent was called, he swore positively that, just before the fall of his companion, he saw a boat, with a single man in it, at a short distance from the shore, and, as far as he could judge by the light of a few stars, it was the same boat in which I had just landed. A woman deposed that she lived near the beach and was standing at the door of her cottage, waiting for the return of the fisherman about an hour before she heard of the discovery of the body, when she saw a boat with only one man in it push off from that part of the shore where the corpse was afterwards found. 
another woman confirmed the account of the fisherman having brought the body into her house it was not cold they put it into a bed and rubbed it and daniel went to the town for an apothecary but life was quite gone several other men were examined concerning my landing and they agreed that with the strong north wind that had arisen during the night it was very probable that i had beaten about for many hours and had been obliged to return nearly to the same spot from which i had departed besides they observed that it appeared that i had brought the body from another place and it was likely that as i did not appear to know the shore i might have put into the harbour ignorant of the distance of the town of and you get to fill in the blank of what the town is so fun <laughs> from the place where i had deposited the corpse mr kerwin on hearing this evidence desired that i should be taken into the room where the where the body lay for internment that it might be observed what effect the sight of it would produce upon me this idea was probably suggested by the extreme agitation i had exhibited when the mode of the murder had been described i was accordingly conducted by the magistrate and several other persons to the inn i could not help being struck by the strange coincidences that had taken place during this eventful night but knowing that i had been conversing with several persons in the island i had inhabited about the time that the body had been found I was perfectly tranquil as to the consequences of the affair. I entered the room where the corpse lay, and was led up to the coffin. How can I describe my sensations on beholding it? I feel yet parched with horror, nor can I reflect on that terrible moment without shuddering and agony that faintly reminds me of the anguish of the recognition. The trial the presence of the magistrate and witnesses passed like a dream from my memory when i saw the lifeless form of henry clerval stretched before me oh no his friend i gasped for breath and throwing myself on the body i exclaimed have my murderous machinations deprived you also my dearest henry of life two i have already destroyed other victims await their destiny but you clerval my friend my benefactor the human frame could no longer support the agonizing suffering that i had endured and i was carried out of the room in strong convulsions a fever succeeded to this i lay for two months on the on the point of death my ravings as i afterwards heard were frightful i called myself the murderer of william of justine and of clerval sometimes i entreated my attendants to assist me in the destruction of the fiend by whom i was tormented and at others i felt the fingers of the monster already grasping my neck and screamed aloud with agony and terror fortunately as i spoke my native language mr kerwin alone understood me but my gestures and bitter cries were sufficient to affright the other witnesses why did i not die most more miserable than man ever was before why did i not sink into forgetfulness and rest death snatches away many blooming children the only hopes of their doting parents how many brides and youthful lovers have been one day in the bloom of health and hope and the next a prey for worms and the decay of the tomb of what materials was i made that i could thus resist so many shocks which like the turning of the wheel continually renewed the torture but i was doomed to live and in two months found myself as awaking from a dream in a prison stretched on a wretched bed surrounded by gaolers turnkeys bolts and all the miserable apparatus of a dungeon it was morning i remember when i thus awoke to understanding i had forgotten the particulars of what had happened and only felt as if some great misfortune had suddenly overwhelmed me but when i looked around 
and saw the barred windows and the squalidness of the room in which i was all flashed across my memory and i groaned bitterly this sound disturbed an old woman who was sleeping in a chair beside me she was a hired nurse the wife of one of the turnkeys and her countenance expressed all those bad qualities which often characterize that class the lines of her face were hard and rude like that of persons unaccustomed to see without sympathizing in sights of misery her tone expressed her entire indifference she addressed me in english and the voice struck me as one that i had heard during my sufferings are you better now sir asked she i replied in the same language with a feeble voice i am but if it be all true if indeed i did not dream i am sorry that i am still alive to feel this misery and horror for that matter replied the old woman if you mean about the gentleman you murdered i believe that it were better for you if you were dead for i fancy it will go hard with you but you will be hung when the next sessions come however that's none of my business i am sent to nurse you and get you well i do my duty with a safe conscience it were well if my body did the same i turned with loathing from the woman who could utter so unfeeling a speech to a person just saved on the very edge of death but i felt languid and unable to reflect on all that had passed the whole series of my life appeared to me as a dream i sometimes doubted if indeed it were all true for it never presented itself to my mind with the force of reality as the images had floated before me became more distinct i grew feverish a darkness pressed around me no one was near me who soothed me with the gentle voice of love no dear hand supported me the physician came and prescribed medicines and the old woman prepared them for me but other carelessness was visible in the first and the expression of brutality was strongly marked in the visage of the second who could be interested in the fate of a murderer but the hangman who would gain his fee these were my first reflections but i soon learned that mr kerwin had shewn me extreme kindness he had caused the best room in the prison to be prepared for me wretched indeed was the best and it was he who had provided a physician and a nurse it is true he seldom came to see me for although he ardently desired to relieve the sufferings of every human creature he did not wish to be present at the agonies and miserable ravings of a murderer he came therefore sometimes to see that i was not neglected but his visits were short and at long intervals one day when i was gradually recovering i was seated in a chair my eyes half open and my cheeks livid like those in death i was overcome by gloom and misery and often reflected i had better seek death than remain miserably pent up only to be let loose in a world replete with wretchedness at one time i considered whether i should not declare myself guilty and suffer the penalty of law less innocent than poor justine had been such were my thoughts when the door of my apartment was opened and mr kerwin entered his countenance expressed sympathy and compassion he drew a chair close to mine and addressed me in french oh good it is written in english excellent <laughs> i was worried it's like oh no i'm gonna have to pretend that i speak french i fear that this place is very shocking to you can i do anything to make you more comfortable i thank you but all that you mention is nothing to me on the whole earth there is no comfort which i am capable of receiving i know that the sympathy of a stranger can be but of little relief to one borne down as you are by so strange a misfortune but you will i hope soon quit this melancholy abode for doubtless evidence can easily be brought to free you from the criminal charge That is my least concern i am by a course of strange events become the most miserable of mortals 
persecuted and tortured as I am and have been, can death be any evil to me? Nothing, indeed, could be more unfortunate and agonizing than the strange chances that have lately occurred. You were thrown, by some surprising accident, on this shore, renowned for its hospitality, seized immediately, and charged with murder. The first sight that was presented to your eyes was the body of your friend, murdered in so unaccountable a manner, and placed, as it were, by some fiend across your path. As Mr. Kerwin said this, notwithstanding the agitation I endured on this, retrospect, on this retrospect of my sufferings, I also felt considerable surprise at the knowledge he seemed to possess concerning me. I suppose some astonishment was ex exhibited in my countenance, for Mr. Kerwin hastened to say, It was not until a day or two after your illness that I thought of examining your dress, that I might discover some trace by which I could send to your relations an account of your misfortune and illness. I found several letters, and, among others, one which I discovered from its commencement to be from your father. I instantly wrote to Geneva. Nearly two months have lapsed since the departure of my letter. But you are ill. Even now you tremble. You are unfit for agitation of any kind. Oh, no. Oh, no. This suspense is a thousand times worse than the most horrible event. Tell me what new scene of death has been acted, and whose murder I am now to lament. Your family is perfectly well, said Mr. Kerwin, with gentleness, and someone, a friend, has come to visit you. I know not by what chain of thought the idea presented itself, but it instantly darted into my mind that the murderer had come to mock at my misery and taunt me with the death of Clerval as a new incitement for me to comply with his hellish desires. I put my hand before my eyes and cried out in agony, Oh, take him away! I cannot see him! For God's sakes, do not let him enter! Mr. Kerwin regarded me with a troubled countenance. He could not help regarding my exclamation as a presumption of my guilt, and said, in rather a severe tone, I should have thought, young man, that the presence of your father would have been welcome instead of inspiring such violent repugnance. My father! I cried, while every feature and every muscle was relaxed from anguish to pleasure. Is my father indeed come? How kind, how very kind! But where is he? Why does he not hasten to me? Dude, you're in prison and you are sickly. Maybe that is why he does not hasten. <laughs> A change of manner surprised and pleased the magistrate. Perhaps he thought that my former exclamation was a momentary return of delirium, and now he instantly resumed his former benevolence. He rose and quitted the room with my nurse, and in a moment my father entered it. Nothing, at this moment, could have given me greater pleasure than the arrival of my father. I stretched out my hand to him and cried, "'Are you then safe, and Elizabeth, and Ernest?' My father calmed me with assurances of their welfare, and endeavoured, by dwelling on these subjects so interesting to my heart, to raise my desponding spirits. But he soon felt that a prison cannot be the abode of cheerfulness. "'What a place is this that you inhabit, my son?' said he, looking mournfully at the barred windows and wretched appearance of the room. "'You travelled to seek happiness, but a fatality seems to pursue you, and poor Clerval. The name of my unfortunate and murdered friend was an agitation too great to be endured in my weak state. I shed tears. "'Alas, yes, my father,' replied I. Some destiny of the most horrible kind hangs over me, and I must live to fulfill it, or surely I should have died on the coffin of Henry. We were not allowed to converse for any length of time, for the precarious state of my health rendered every precaution necessary that could ensure tranquillity. Mr. Kerwin came in, and insisted that my strength should not be exhausted by too much exertion but the appearance of my father was to me like that of my good angel, and I gradually recovered my health. As my sickness quitted me, I was absorbed by a gloomy and black melancholy that nothing could dissipate. The image of Clerval was forever before me, ghastly and murdered. 
more than once the agitation into which these reflections threw me made my friends dread a d dangerous relapse alas why did they preserve so miserable and detested a life it was surely that i might fulfil my destiny which is now drawing to a close soon oh very soon will death extinguish these throbbings and relieve me from the mighty weight of anguish that bears me to the dust and in executing the award of justice i shall also sink to rest then the appearance of death was distant although the wish was ever present to my thoughts and i often sat for hours motionless and speechless wishing for some mighty revolution that might bury me and my destroyer in its ruins the season of the assizes approached i had already been three months in prison and although i was still weak and in continual danger of a relapse i was obliged to travel nearly a hundred miles to the country town where the court was held mr kerwin charged himself with every care of collecting witnesses and arranging my defence i was spared the disgrace of appearing publicly as a criminal as the case was not brought before the court that decides on life and death the grand jury rejected the bill on its being proved that i was on the orkney islands at the hour the body of my friend was found and a fortnight after my removal was liberated from prison my father was enraptured on finding me freedom on finding me freed from the vexations of a criminal charge that i was again allowed to breathe the fresh atmosphere and allowed to return to my native country i did not participate in these feelings for to me the walls of a dungeon or a palace were alike hateful the cup of life was poisoned for ever and although the sun shone upon me as upon the happy end and gay of heart i saw around me nothing but a dense and frightful darkness penetrated by no light but the glimmer of two eyes that glared upon me sometimes they were the expressive eyes of henry languishing in death the dark orbs nearly covered by the lids and the long black lashes that fringed them sometimes it was the watery clouded eyes of the monster as i first saw them in my chamber at ingolstadt my father tried to awaken me in the feelings of affection he talked of geneva which i should soon visit of elizabeth and ernest but these words only drew deep groans from me sometimes indeed i felt a wish for happiness and thought with melancholy delight of my beloved cousin or longed with a devouring melody du pays to see once more the blue lake and rapid rhone that had been so dear to me in early childhood but my general state of feeling was a torpor in which a prison was as was as welcome a residence as the divinest scene in nature and these fits were seldom interrupted but by paroxysms of anguish and despair at these moments i often endeavoured to put an end to the existence i loathed and it required unceasing attendance and vigilance to restrain me from committing some dreadful act of violence i remember as i quitted the prison i heard one of the men say he may be innocent of the murder but he has certainly a bad conscience these words struck me a bad conscience yes surely i had one william justine and clerval had died through my infernal machinations and whose death cried i is to finish the tragedy oh, my father do not remain in this wretched country take me where i may forget myself my existence and all the world my father easily acceded to my desire and after having taken leave of mr kerwin we hastened to dublin i felt as if i was relieved from a heavy weight when the packet sailed with a fair wind from ireland and i had quitted for ever the country which had been to me the scene of so much misery it was midnight 
My father slept in the cabin, and I lay on the deck, looking at the stars and listening to the dashing of the waves. I hailed the darkness that shut Ireland from my sight, and my pulse beat with a feverish joy when I reflected that I should soon see Geneva. The past appeared to me in the light of a frightful dream, yet the vessel in which I was, the wind that blew me from the detested shore of Ireland and the sea which surrounded me, told me too forcibly that I was deceived by no vision, and that Clerval, my friend and dearest companion, had fallen a victim to me and the monster of my creation. I repassed, in my memory, my whole life, my quiet happiness while residing with my family in Geneva, the death of my mother, and my departure for Ingolstadt. I remembered shuddering at the mad enthusiasm that hurried me on to the creation of my hideous enemy, and I called to mind the night during which he first lived. I was unable to pursue the train of thought. A thousand feelings pressed upon me, and I wept bitterly. Ever since my recovery from the fever, I had been in the custom of taking every night a small quantity of laudanum, for it was by means of this drug only that I was unable, that I was enabled to gain the rest necessary for the preservation of life. Oppressed by the recollection of my various misfortunes, I now took a double dose and soon slept profoundly. But sleep did not afford me respite from thought and misery. My dreams presented a thousand objects that scared me. Towards morning I was possessed by a kind of nightmare. I felt the fiend's grasp in my neck, and could not free myself from it. Groans and cries rung in my ears. My father, who was watching over me, perceiving my restlessness, awoke me, and pointed to the port of Hollyhead, which we were now entering. End of chapter four. All right, so... So, um, a lot has happened. <laughs> Victor washes up on shore, is like, all right, well, you need to... The monster does not have a name. No. <laughs> you need to, like, prove your innocence because there was murder here last night and we have the body. And so people are speaking out saying, you know, like, I saw a man alone on a boat and this was obviously still this was obviously victor and victor is like well it wasn't me so i don't know what to do and they show victor the body and it is his good pal henry clerval and so instantly he knows that it was the monster also he has the finger marks on his neck the same as what william had so Victor just, like, goes into shock, makes himself super sick because of it. Because, basically, he has destroyed directly three people's lives. And so he, like, wakes up. He's been in prison for two months. And this person is, like, nursing him back to health. And the magistrate is like, look, I know it probably wasn't you. Like, it was your friend. But you need to know that, like something terrible is happening to your life. Like, you know this, right? Like, you're from out of town. Somehow this fiend knows that you're there or that you're going to land here and has killed your best friend and laid him here for you to find him. That's pretty terrible. Um, and so Victor's dad is there and Victor's like, Papa, I need to leave. I can't be here. Like, I need to, I need to be where no people are. Like, I cannot be here. I cannot be okay with existence because my existence is not okay. And Papa is like, all right, cool. We'll, we will go far, far away. Let us go. And so they are heading out and Yeah. I'm super enjoying this. I really like uh, that the creation, the monster, is like, dude, you said that you were going to do this. Make me a friend. And when Victor, like, went back on that, he's like, all right, well, 
I told you that I was going to murder all of your friends and family if you didn't do this. Here we go. Murder. Daddy, I just, I just can't be here. <laughs> I know. No name. The worst. Maybe if he had a name, he would, um, he would be a little bit nicer, you know? Not so much murder. <laughs> hard to say. It is hard to say. All right. <laughs> nay, nay. <laughs> okay. We'll do one more. Chapter five. We had resolved not to go to London, but to cross the country to Portsmouth and hence and fence to embark for Havre. Havre. I preferred this plan, principally because I dreaded to see again those places in which I had enjoyed a few moments of tranquility with my beloved Clerval. I thought with horror of seeing again those persons whom we had been accustomed to visit together, and who might make inquiries concerning an event, the very remembrance of which made me again feel the pang I endured when I gazed on his lifeless form in the inn. As for my father, his desires and exertions were bounded to the again seeing me restored to health and peace of mind. His tenderness and attentions were unremitting. My grief and gloom was obstinate, but he would not despair. Sometimes he thought that I felt deeply the degradation of being obliged to answer a charge of murder, and he endeavored to prove to me the futility of pride. Alas, my father, said I, how little do you know me. Human beings, their feelings and passions, would indeed be degraded if such a wretch as I felt pride. Justine, poor, unhappy Justine, was as innocent as I, and she suffered the same charge. She died for it, and I am the cause of this. I murdered her. William, Justine, and Henry, they all died by my hands. My father had often, during my imprisonment, heard me make the same assertion. When I thus accused myself, he sometimes seemed to desire an explanation, and at others he appeared to consider it as caused by a delirium, and that, during my illness, some idea of this kind had presented itself to my imagination, the remembrance of which I preserved in my convalescence. I avoided explanation and maintained a continual silence concerning the wretch I had created. I had a feeling that I should be supposed mad, and this forever chained my tongue. When I would have given the whole world, I have confided the fatal secret. Upon this occasion my father said, with an expression of unbounded wonder, "'What do you mean, Victor? Are you mad? My dear son, I entreat you never to make such an assertion again.' "'I am not mad.' I cried energetically. The sun and the heavens who have viewed my operations can bear witness of my truth. I am the assassin. I am the assassin of those most innocent victims. They died by my machinations. A thousand times would I have shed my own blood, drop by drop, to save, to have saved their lives. Sorry, he's just talking real weird right now. It must be the laudanum. But I could not, my father, indeed I could not sacrifice the whole human race. The conclusion of this speech convinced my father that my ideas were deranged, and he instantly changed the subject of our conversation, and endeavored to alter the course of my thoughts. He wished as much as possible to obliterate the memory of the scenes that had taken place in Ireland, and never alluded to them, or suffered me to speak of my misfortunes. As time passed away, I became more calm. Misery had her dwelling in my heart, and I no longer talked in the same incoherent manner of my own crimes. Sufficient for me was the consciousness of them. By the utmost self-violence, I curbed the imperious voice of wretchedness, which sometimes desired to declare itself to the whole world, and my manners were calmer and more composed than they had ever been since my journey to the Sea of Ice." 
we arrived at havre on the eighth of may and instantly proceeded to paris where my father had been had some business which detained us a few weeks in this city i received the following letter from elizabeth to victor frankenstein my dearest friend it gave me the greatest pleasure to receive a letter from my uncle dated at paris you are no longer at a formidable distance and i may hope to see you in less than a fortnight my poor cousin how much you have suffered i expect to see you looking even more ill than when you quitted geneva this winter has been passed most miserably tortured as i have been by anxious suspense yet i hope to see peace in your countenance and to find that your heart is not totally devoid of comfort and tranquillity yet i feel i fear that the same feelings now exist that made you so miserable a year ago even perhaps augmented by time i would not disturb you at this period when so many misfortunes weigh upon you but a conversation that i had with my uncle previous to this departure renders some explanation necessary before we meet explanation you may possibly say what can elizabeth have to explain if you really say this my questions are answered and i have no more to do than to sign myself your affect your affectionate cousin but you are distant from me and it is possible that you may dread and yet be pleased with this explanation and in a probability of this being the case i dare not any longer postpone writing what during your absence i have often wished to express to you but have never had the courage to begin you well know victor that our union had been the favourite plan of your parents ever since our infancy we were told this when young and taught to look forward to it as an event that would certainly take place we were affectionate playfellows during childhood and i believe dear and valued friends to one another as we grew older but as brother and sister often entertain a lively affection towards each other without desiring a more intimate union may not such also be our case tell me dearest victor answer me i can i conjure you by our mutual happiness with simple truth do you not love another you have travelled you have spent several years of your life at ingolstadt and i confess to you my friend that when i saw you last autumn so unhappy flying to solitude from the society of every creature i could not help supposing that you might regret our connection and believe yourself bound in honour to fulfil the wishes of your parents although they oppose themselves to your inclinations but this is false reasoning i confess to you my cousin that i love you and that in my airy dreams of futurity you have been my constant friend and companion but it is your happiness i desire as well as my own when i declare to you that our marriage would render me eternally miserable unless it were the dictate of your own free choice even now i weep to think that borne down as you are by the cruelest misfortunes you may stifle by the word honour all hope of that love and happiness which would alone restore you to yourself i who have so interested an affection for you may increase your miseries tenfold by being an obstacle to your wishes oh, victor be assured that your cousin and playmate has too sincere a love for you not to be made miserable by this supposition be happy my friend and if you obey me in this one request remain satisfied that nothing on earth will have the power to interrupt my tranquillity do not let this letter disturb you do not answer it to-morrow or the next day or even until you come if it will give you pain my uncle will send me news of your health and if i see but one smile on your lips when we meet occasioned by this or any other exertion of mine i shall need no other happiness elizabeth lavenza geneva may eighteenth this letter revived in my memory what i had before forgotten the threat of the fiend i will be with you on your wedding night such was my sentence and on that night would the demon employ every art to destroy me and tear me from the glimpse of happiness which promised partly to console my sufferings on that night he had determined to cons consummate his crimes by my death well be it so 
a deadly struggle would then assuredly take place in which if he was victorious i should be at peace and his power over me be at an end if he were vanquished i should be a free man alas what freedom such as the peasant enjoys when his family has have been massacred before his eyes his cottage burnt his lands laid waste and he is turned adrift homeless penniless and alone but free such would be my liberty except that in my elizabeth i possessed a treasure alas balanced by those horrors of remorse and guilt which would pursue me until death sweet and beloved elizabeth i read and re-read her letter and some softened feelings stole into my heart and dared to whisper paradisical dreams of love and joy but the apple was already eaten and the angel's arm bared to drive me from all hope yet i would die to make her happy if the monster executed his threat death was inevitable yet again i considered whether my marriage would hasten my fate my destruction might indeed arrive a few months sooner but if my torturer should suspect that i postponed it influenced by his menaces he would surely find another and perhaps more dreadful means of revenge he had vowed to be with me on my wedding night yet he did not consider that threat as binding him to peace in the meantime for as if to show me that he was not yet sati satiated with blood he had murdered clerval immediately after the annunciation of his threats i resolved therefore that if my immediate union with my cousin would conduce either to hers or my father's happiness my adversary's designs against my life should not slow down it an hour a single hour in this state of mind i wrote to elizabeth my letter was calm and affectionate i fear my beloved girl i said little happiness remains for us on earth yet all that i may one day enjoy is concentred in you chase away your idle fears to you alone do i consecrate my life and my endeavours for contentment i have one secret elizabeth a dreadful one when revealed to you it will chill your frame with horror and then far from being surprised at my misery you will only wonder that i survive what i have endured i will confide this tale of misery and terror to you the day after our marriage shall take place for my sweet cousin there must be perfect confidence between us but until then i can conjure you do not mention or allude to it this i most earnestly entreat and i know you will comply in about a week after the arrival of elizabeth's letter we returned to geneva my cousin welcomed me with warm affection yet tears were in her eyes as she beheld me my emaciated frame and feverish cheeks i saw a change in her also she was thinner and had lost much of that heavenly vivacity that had before charmed me but her gentleness and soft looks of compassion made her a more fit companion for one blasted and miserable as i was the tranquillity which i now enjoyed did not endure memory brought madness with it and when i thought on what had passed a real insanity possessed me sometimes i was furious and burnt with rage sometimes low and despondent i neither spork i neither spork i neither spoke or looked but sat motionless bewildered by the multitude of miseries that overcame me elizabeth alone had the power to draw me from these fits her gentle voice would soothe me when transported by passion and inspire me with human feelings when sunk in torpor she wept with me and for me when reason returned she would remonstrate and endeavour to inspire me with resignation ah it is well for the unfortunate to be resigned but for the guilty there is no peace the agonies of remorse poison the luxury there is otherwise sometimes found in indulging the excess of grief soon after my arrival my father spoke of my immediate marriage with my cousin i remained silent have you then some other attachment 
none on earth. I love Elizabeth and look forward to our union with delight. Let the day therefore be fixed, and on it I will consecrate myself in life or death to the happiness of my cousin. My dear Victor, do not speak thus. Heavy misfortunes have befallen us, but let us only cling closer to what remains, and transfer our love for those whom we have lost to those who yet live. Our circle will be small, but bound close by the ties of affection and mutual misfortune, and when time shall have softened your despair, new and dear objects of care will be born to replace those of whom we have been so cruelly deprived. Such were the lessons of my father. But to me the remembrance of the threat returned. Nor can you wonder that, omnipotent as the fiend had yet been in his deed of blood, I should almost regard him as invincible, and that when he had pronounced the words, I shall be with you on your wedding night, I should regard the threatened fate as unavoidable. But death was no evil to me. If the loss of Elizabeth were balanced with it, and I therefore with a contented and even cheerful countenance agreed with my father, that if my cousin would consent, the ceremony should take place in ten days, and thus put, as I imagined, the seal to my fate. Great God, if for one instant I had thought what might be the hellish intention of my fiendish adversary, I would rather have banished myself for ever from my native country, and wandered a friendless outcast over the earth than have consented to this miserable marriage. But, as if possessed of magic powers, the monster had blinded me to his real intentions, and when I thought that I prepared only my own death, I hastened that of a far dearer victim. As the period fixed of our marriage drew nearer, whether from cowardice or prophetic feeling, I felt my heart sink within me, but I concealed my feelings by an appearance of hilarity that brought smiles and joy to the countenance of my father, but hardly deceived the ever-watchful and nicer eye of Elizabeth. She looked forward to our union with placid contentment, not unmingled with a little fear which past misfortunes had impressed, that what now appeared certain and tangible happiness might soon dissipate into an airy dream, and leave no trace but deep and everlasting regret. Preparations were made for the event, congratulatory visits were received, and all wore a smiling appearance. I shut up, as well as I could, in my own heart the anxiety that prayed there, and entered with seeming earnestness into the plans of my father, although they might only serve as the decorations of my tragedy. A house was purchased for us near Colony, by which we should enjoy the pleasures of the country, and yet be so near Geneva as to see my father every day, he would still reside within the walls for the benefit of Ernest, that he might follow his studies at the schools. In the meantime, I took every precaution to defend my person, in case the fiend should openly attack me. I carried pistols and a dagger constantly about me, and was ever on the watch to prevent artifice, and by these means gained a greater degree of tranquillity. Indeed, as the period approached, the threat appeared more as a delusion, not to be regarded as worthy to disturb my peace, while the happiness I hoped for in my marriage wore a greater appearance for certainty. As the day fixed for its solemnization drew nearer, and I heard it continually spoken of as an occurrence which no accident could possibly prevent. Elizabeth seemed happy. My tranquil demeanor contributed greatly to calm her mind, but on the day that was to fulfill my wishes and my destiny she was melancholy, and a presentiment of evil pervaded her, and perhaps also she thought of the dreadful secret which I had promised to reveal to her the following day. My father was in the meantime overjoyed, and in the bustle of preparation only observed in the melancholy of his niece the diffidence of a bride. After the ceremony was performed, a large party assembled at my father's, but it was agreed that Elizabeth and I should pass the afternoon and night at Evian, and return to Colony the next morning. 
as the day was fair and the wind favorable we resolved to go by water those were the last moments of my life during which i enjoyed the feeling of happiness we passed rapidly along the sun was hot but we were sheltered from its rays by a kind of canopy while we enjoyed the beauty of the scene sometimes on one side of the lake where we saw mount salev the pleasant banks of montalegre and at a distance surmounting all the beautiful mont blanc and the assemblage of snowy mountains that in vain endeavour to emulate her sometimes coasting the opposite banks we saw the mighty jura opposing its dark side to the ambition that would quit its native country and an almost insurmountable barrier to the invader who should wish to enslave it i took the hand of elizabeth you are sorrowful my love ah if you knew what i have suffered and what i may yet endure you would endeavour to let me taste the quiet and freedom from despair that this one day at least permits me to enjoy be happy my dear victor replied elizabeth there is i hope nothing to distress you and be assured that if a lively joy is not painted in my face my heart is contented Some something whispers to me not to depend too much on the prospect that is opened before us but i will not listen to such a sinister voice observe how fast we move along and how the clouds which sometimes obscure and sometimes rise above the dome of mont blanc render this scene of beauty still more interesting look also at the innumerable fish that are swimming in the clear waters where we can distinguish every petal every pebble that lies at the bottom what a divine day how happy and serene all nature appears thus elizabeth endeavoured to divert her thoughts and mine from all reflection upon melancholy subjects but her temper was fluctuating joy for a few instants shone in her eyes but it continually gave place to distraction and reverie the sun sunk lower in the heavens we passed the river drance and observed its path through the chasm of the higher and the glens of the lower hills the alps here came come closer to the lake and we approached the amphitheatre of mountains which forms its eastern boundary the spire of evian shone under the woods that surrounded it and the range of mountain above mountain by which it was overhung the wind which had hitherto carried us along with amazing rapidity sunk at sunset to a light breeze the soft air just ruffled the water and caused a pleasant motion among the trees as we approached the shore from which it wafted the most delightful scent of flowers and hay the sun sunk beneath the horizon as we landed and as i touched the shore i felt those cares and fears revive which soon were to clasp me and cling to me forever end of chapter five all right so elizabeth was worried that there might be another woman and victor's like why well i don't think victor thinks thinks this but i was like why does why is that automatically the assumption that everybody makes but victor is like no no my love my lovely lovely cousin it is you that i will marry and so he decides to hasten the wedding because even though the monster has the threat of we will meet again on your wedding day victor is like i need to at least have my dad and my cousin be happy like it's fine that i will die it's fine and so he writes to elizabeth and is like nope that's not it but there is something that's bothering me um it, i promise i won't let it bother me and i will tell you everything the day after we get married which is totally i feel like the same concept as like the woman with like the like black ribbon that's like oh no not yet like you can pull it when i'm ready and then like it keeps going you know what i mean um and so they get married and uh victor is like well this is the last moment that i have ever been happy so it's actually another man well monster there is something i have to tell you <laughs> <laughs> oof <laughs> see we're pretty close to finishing we're well pretty close 
80 percent 81 percent it's not bad not too shabby it's exciting okay so that's gonna be it for today we will pick right back up right where we left off next time i'm still really enjoying it i'm liking this i'm liking the impending doom <laughs> of course i'm excited i'm excited all right so that's gonna be it for me today i will be back very soon where we will continue our story um as always whether you lurk whether you chat i want a thousand percent appreciate you and i want a thousand percent appreciate your support i hope you all have a great night and if i don't see you next time i hope to see you very soon bye